talking about grief and the expressive arts, that's the task that's been given to me by my friends in Istanbul. How can I do that? To talk about grief, ultimately, is to talk about death. And maybe death is the one thing you can't really talk about. I always say to my students, start where you are, go where you're called. Where am I? Hmm. <laughs> I'm sitting at my desk in Toronto, talking to an invisible audience, who I imagine to be waiting for a profound insight. And yet I'm beginning with the sense that maybe I have nothing to say. What can I say about death and grief and the arts? Oh, many years ago, what comes to me is that I think I was maybe 21 or so, or 23. So, so you're talking 60 years ago. The words came to me. The beauty of flowers is the beauty of endings. If it lasted, who could stand it? Let it die. Oh, let it die. It has something to do, it has something to do with uh, art, beauty, love, and death. These are the themes that come together to me. What do I think about in the middle of the night? Mm -hmm. Not a good time. I'm up at three o'clock, which I was last night. I think about death, it seems very near. And I can easily give in to despair. And then after many minutes pass, suddenly what comes to me is a sense that love is the answer. How do you meet death? Only with love, only with art. And art comes from love of beauty. It's very difficult to think these things together. Maybe the one thing you can't think about really is death. The one thing we can't put into our experience. What's the phenomenology of death and dying? Hmm. I think by the time we know, it's too late. But the death of others is what we mourn. That's where mourning comes in. I'm thinking about my friend Paolo Canil, who was the founder of the European Graduate School and who brought me and Ellen into the school in 1996 to start the program in expressive arts. When I think of the end of the course, which we spent together, four of us, no, five of us, uh, Paolo, his wife and partner, Margot Camille, uh, myself, Ellen Levine, and Mike and Jacoby, there were five, and we taught every course. There was no breaks at all. It was exhausting. And at the end of it, we met at the Rhine River down below the school. And we said, we did it, we did it. And there was this wonderful sense of completion. And now I think of Paolo, who died a little over a year ago and a poem I wrote for him, for Paolo. 
My friend's hand shakes like mine when pouring salt. It's in his family, he says, along with other things. Father's music, mother's herbs, and the memory of war, his best friend gone. So many years, Peru, Israel, the American adventure, and now returning home. Rhine water falling, it sound like Bach, the mountains of Sasfe promising peace. What is the sound of a man's life? The music that will linger when he is gone. Or is it silence, air, a whispering breeze, murmuring the prayer, return, once more, return. There's an old Latin expression, vita brevis ars longi. Life is short, art is long. Mm. How long? <laughs> Not eternal, but hopefully a while. The music that lingers when we are gone. We think of our own death and engage in anticipatory grief or the death of others we love. Recently, I had a friend tell me that his son, I think his young son, was in the hospital for two days with pulmonary emphysema. And I imagine that he worried about whether he would stay with us, whether he would come out of the hospital alive. And I thought of my own grandson, Leo, who was six years old and how precious he is and how I could not survive his loss if it were to happen. I'm not sure that there would be poems that would be adequate for that kind of loss. And there are other deaths that are very hard to mourn. Mass death. I think of the Holocaust, Shoah, and the death of six million Jews in Europe. How do you mourn that? And there's also this sense of inherited mourning. Death that comes down to us that we have not ourselves experienced or known or lived. How do you overcome that, this grief that is inconsolable? I'm not sure. I've written many poems about the Holocaust, but have I grieved it? What does it mean to grieve something? It doesn't mean that it's over. It doesn't mean, oh, now I'm okay. Now I feel fine. No, it means that I'm willing to meet it. I'm willing to meet it and still say yes to life. Is that always possible? I like to say to students, poesis is always possible. <laughs> is it true? I don't know. Can we keep creating? even in the face of death, or is all creation in the face of death? Does all love have the memory of a future death? <sighs> the music that will linger when he is gone. I'm going to pause for a moment. Now I'm thinking about a friend of mine who died a little over a year ago, like Paolo, but not a friend from EGS, a friend from Toronto. 
Her name was Gisa. And she was a brilliant artist. She worked in color and form and shape, abstract work, beautiful work. And yet she was depressed, clinically depressed. She could barely leave her house. And it took so much for her to actually go to the studio and paint. And this is the poem I wrote to her, to a lost friend in elegy. Oh, Gisa, you were always trying to break through, yet something held you back. Some dark form, cloud, shape, threatening. And then all the bright colors, the pictures, did they win? Or was it an interminable battle? chaos against form. We strive, it waits, knowing it will stop us. But we say, no, not always, not forever. Look, we say, I am leading colors, love, pain. We must go on. That is all we have, all we are. You must go on and on until you end at last and leave your beauty behind. Uh, poetry is one way that I meet death. I don't win. <laughs> I will die, you will die, everyone we love will die. The earth itself will die someday and all the species on it that we've tried so hard to get rid of to make room for ourselves. But we have to go on and on and leave our beauty behind. Pausing again. There's another, I think I've recording. I think I'm still recording. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that I'm, I'm going to the poems. It's the only thing I could think of. Um, tears, yes, but you can never cry enough, really. I recently read a book called The Sisters of Auschwitz, which was a story of two sisters who lived through the Holocaust in Holland and were incredibly ingenious. I would say that they really lived the spirit of poesis, always finding a new way to live and bring beauty into the world. And this, this, they ended at Auschwitz. They did not die. They were the fortunate ones. Or not so fortunate, but they lived on. And this book was so powerful. I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. But I was struck struck by the beauty of the story they lived. And I found another poem that I want to read to you. It's called Chasing Joy. And it has an epigraph, a quote from another mm -hmm. author, Andre Gregory, who was a theater person. And he said, in the course of a conversation, the grief isn't the whole thing. The grief isn't the whole thing. There is also art, the joy of creation, even in the face of pain, even, if, even in the suffering at the border, even in the horror of the camps, all the camps. If grief is all, there is no hope, but there is always hope, even in despair. The light shining, illuminating the dark, promising relief, hold fast. 
Do not despair. In your loneliness, there is love. Love everywhere. You know, poems come to me. I feel like sometimes I don't really write them. They just, they just do what Paolo said you do in therapy, which is open the door and stand aside. You can't make the person better <laughs> or healed or it's all the mirage, but what you can do is open the door for them and let them come in. And then find their own way. So I think my way is to go deeply, deeply, deeply into the grief of loss and to find in poems, to open myself to the words that come. <laughs> is that the only way? I don't know. The poet Rilke was obsessed with death and love. And in the sonnets to Orpheus, this was the sonnet sequence that he wrote, inspired by the death of a young woman whom he barely knew, which was a beautiful dance of Vera Knoop. And he imagines the poet Orpheus singing of life and death. You know, the story of Orpheus is a beautiful story. It's about uh, a poet whose song was so beautiful that the whole earth resounded with his voice. When he sang, he brought joy to creation. And he fell in love. He fell in love with a woman named Eurydice. And he sang love songs to her that made her heart open. And all the beings that heard these songs, their hearts opened. And then she died. She was bitten by a snake in the fields. And her soul went down to what they called Hades, where only the dead souls live in Greek mythology. And Orpheus sang songs of grief, songs that were so, so sad that every being felt bereft. But he felt he had to go after Eurydice. He had to go into the realm of death, into Hades, to find her. And he did. He went down, down, down to the darkness. And there, Hades is guarded by a fierce dog, a monster named Cerberus. But his song, the song of Orpheus, was so beautiful that Cerberus' anger was stilled, and he let Orpheus pass into Hades. And he met the king of Hades himself and asked him to bring Eurydice back to life, back to the surface of the earth from the depths of hell. And Hades said, you can bring her back. She will follow you. But if you turn to look back, you will lose her forever. And so, Orpheus started to go up to the surface of the earth, to the world that we live in. And Eurydice followed him to come back to the world of life. But he couldn't hear her. He couldn't tell whether she was there. Until finally, he could not help looking back to see if he, she was there. And when he did, she was lost forever. And then Orpheus sang immensely tragic songs. But the women of the town in which he lived now wanted him.
and he refused them. He refused them all. He was, his grief was inconsolable. He would only live for Eurydice. And their lust or love turned to anger and hatred, and they loosed their arrows at him. But his song was so powerful, it, it turned the arrows into impotent life. They fell to the ground. And then the women of the town beat rocks and kitchen implements as loudly as they could to drown out the so his song. And he died. And then in their anger, they took his body and cut off his head and threw it into the river. This is a part of the myth that most people don't know. Because the story is that as his head floated down the river, it kept on singing. <laughs> well, that to me is the message of art, of grief, of love, of life, of death. It has to keep on singing. <sighs> I say this with the knowledge that I will again fall into despair. And I imagine many of you will as well. <laughs> and yet I say to you, sing on, keep on singing, sing on. Thank you.